so my name is Dennis Batilov. Uh, I'm a principal solutions architect based out of Luxembourg. I work with customers across uh, Europe, Middle East, uh, and Africa, so the EMEA uh, region. And uh, I'm really excited to have here today with me uh, my colleagues, folks from uh, Rockflow Dynamics, uh, Vasily and uh, Scott. Uh, and they're going to talk about you know, a really cool product, T Navigator. It's, a, it's a something, it's the technology that they came up with. Uh, and it's essentially a veritable time machine because starting from the initial conditions about a reservoir, it's able to you know, predict uh, and move you to some time in the future. And this is really a critical uh, piece of technology helping companies uh, in this sector, in the oil and gas sector, to uh, be much more efficient and, and uh, understand uh, what is the value that's in their uh, assets. Okay. So I'll start by throwing this uh, at you, which is uh, kind of a quick uh, gauge of the state of the industry. And uh, the one thing that's uh, uh, being highlighted is uh, a lot of data that either is already collected or is potentially uh, available to be collected and it's not really used in the industry all perhaps the sensory data all the historical data uh, so very low utilization a lot of the budgets are really uh, dedicated towards maintaining things not really innovating and so if you look at the kind of some uh, scores uh, that are put out there uh, for the digital kind of maturity of oil and gas you know we see 4.7 kind of low scores somewhat behind uh, even also conservative industries like banking now who's been uh, able to move uh, forward. Now there are some reasons why uh, this is the case. Uh, of course in some countries it's not even legal to move um, their data outside of the country. So data sovereignty is important. Uh, some of these oil and gas reserves and, and information is, is strategic or considered strategic. But there are also uh, a lot of companies keep that data, or want to keep that data very close to their heart. Uh, it constitutes a lot of their kind of IT and trade uh, secrets, intellectual property. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, the industry is mired with long-term outsourcing contracts, uh, not kind of the core competence uh, of, of IT necessarily, or legacy IT investments. But at the same time, there are things that actually help. Uh, and despite uh, the low, uh, continued kind of low uh, oil prices that are kind of hurting the industry. It's also giving the, the industry an opportunity to reinvent itself and put more innovation and, and cut costs and optimization. And this is a recurrent theme. So it's one of the driving factors behind the changes. But at the same time, a lot of the traditional enterprise IT software is also catching up. And, and now you have deployments of ERP, you know, Oracle, SAP uh, in the cloud, and that's making it a little easier to kind of consider or envision this transition to cloud. There are also companies that are born entirely in the cloud, and then Rockflow Dynamics, perhaps um, uh, not born in the cloud, but uh, certainly considered cloud a very strategic direction early on and have been investing in this uh, uh, for years now. Okay, so if you ask oil and gas customers what is it that they care the most about, uh, of course, safety and, and efficiency uh, is, uh, is very important. IT security is something at the top of the minds of, uh, of uh, the CIOs. And uh, the good news, of course, with AWS is that for many years now, it has been the leader in the uh, security of the cloud uh, platform. And, um, you know, this kind of diagram being thrown around with all the certifications and so on, uh, it's constantly updating. I think 21st of November, We've extended a set of services that are now covered by HIPAA. Uh, a whole bunch of new services are now uh, compliant and so on and so forth. So this landscape is really changing quickly. And this is also making it easy to accept uh, cloud in this industry. Uh, but innovation is clearly important. And hence, we have Rockflow Dynamics. And they will show today uh, the, the demo and the 3D visualizations that they work with. Uh, and they're able to deliver uh, from kind of the cloud to their customers. Now. And the leader in terms of innovation, uh, AWS is also well positioned, as, as you know, and I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on that. Um, I think there is some auto advance on the slides that's going on. Hopefully, I can manage that. Uh, so again, uh, pace of innovation of the cloud, we're continuously releasing new features. You can see uh, in last year, 10 or 1,017 new uh, major features and services that were released. And this is uh, kind of 
ongoing this year. We're certainly slated to break this. Quite frankly, for guys like myself, it's becoming really impossible to keep up with all the major developments, even major ones, right? Not even taking, like looking at the minor stuff that's being updated uh, every time. So if before, you know, the question was, I mean, I'm moving fast and or staying safe, now the, the answer is that uh, you could actually achieve both at the same time. So moving fast and staying secure. Okay, and of course, big data, you know, IoT, this is all related to what we're talking uh, today about. However, things like cost and more cost and more cost, this is really a recurring theme in the industry. And this is the reason why Rockflow uh, Dynamics is actually uh, is able to kind of bring these innovations uh, and, and, and uh, make things more efficient for the customers. So, of course, I want to throw this slide quickly from General Electric Oil and Gas. Um, uh, they've reportedly uh, been able to save quite a bit of money in just 18 months in transferring a lot of stuff. And their CIO uh, quoted uh, two reinvents ago that they see AWS as a partner for the next 140 years of the company. So now let's tie it back to the technology. What are the key building blocks that enable kind of HPC workloads for oil and gas on AWS? So it's Scalable compute, and you could put storage in that same class, right? You need both uh, to, to process data. And more importantly, you need to be able to manage all those resources. That's a really key component. You need to be able to launch clusters. You need to be able to shut them down. So lifecycle management and uh, uh, many other uh, you know, related uh, operations. So CFN cluster has been a library that AWS supported for, for quite some time, but now with um, the acquisition of uh, a nice uh, software uh, a company uh, based in Italy, um, we've been able to bring lots of innovations that this company pioneered, such as Engine Frame Resource Manager. And I forgot to mention that we have Bruno Franzini here, who is ex-nice, uh, but now is uh, kind of leading the global practice in HPC on the professional services side. So again, if you have more questions after the talk, uh, a lot of the technology that uh, I'll mention today, he certainly had uh, his hands <laughs> in there and, and, and can uh, tell you uh, uh, more about some of these details. But, you know, you need networking. You need to be able to bridge these nodes and put them in a in kind of a close uh, clustered environment. And of course, with 20, 25 gigabit per second uh, networking, enhanced networking, and, and new instance types that support it, this becomes a reality. And don't forget the visualization components. There's a separate talk on kind of 3D visualization and NICE software also brought NICE DCV as a solution because you need to have powerful graphics that's available in the cloud. You need to be able to produce your 3D visualizations, some of which you'll see later today. And then you need to bring them to where the engineer sits, somewhere maybe on premises uh, within uh, kind of uh, the company. Okay. So if we look at an HPC cluster, right, it could be many different things to many people. So let's kind of set uh, this quite clear, right? At the bottom layer, we have the, um, the infrastructure, the foundation, right? We're talking about all the resources uh, and the networking components. But then we already talked about visualization that's necessary. Of course, a lot of the algorithms that are run on in the HPC world, uh, they use MPI and other kind of libraries for parallel execution. There's network management. And resource management is a very important component that there are many standard libraries out there that you could use. And in fact, uh, Engine Frame as a, a software uh, that's now you know, available within the AWS uh, offering is supporting all of these uh, resource managers um, that, that you can use and, and, and customize. But then once you um, uh, build this kind of foundational layer, you need to be able to perform pre and post analysis. So for uh, kind of oil and gas uh, scenarios, right, you need to have exploration and production. You have interpretation kind of engineers for uh, uh, upstream and downstream uh, uh, modeling and refinement. And um, we have also the need to integrate with enterprise applications. Of course, Rockflow Dynamics, for example, in their solution, they're offering this not just to um, yeah, kind of a, a particular company, but it's a software as a service, it's a portal through which they're able to formulate a, a kind of a cluster on which their T Navigator software is able to run and then uh, offer this uh, in terms of various uh, products 
through which, uh, through the same uh, kind of platform that these uh, clients of Rockflow Dynamics could consume. And in this slide, uh, what we're seeing is a standard problem that enterprises face, whereas on the right-hand side, we have resources. And then we need to kind of make them available uh, to the consumers, to the users. And so there's something in the middle that uh, is required. And a lot of people are reinventing the wheel, but you don't have to because now we have engine frame that I mentioned, DCV protocol, and a lot of these components we'll see again through the demo today. So a typical kind of life cycle of um, kind of HPC and, and um, you know, simulation for reservoir engineers is you submit a job. So typically you upload your data with some uh, initial uh, state, uh, perhaps sitting in S3 or, or other locations, maybe on premises. You upload that, you choose a particular cluster that you've created, you set various parameters, and then you submit the job for execution. You'll see an example of that today later on. Vasily will show that. And, you know, of course, it takes time for this uh, job to run. Uh, you need to monitor it. Eventually, you get the results and, you know, some uh, information coming back either in the form of 3D visualizations or graphs and other things and that's uh, kind of rinse and repeat. You get the results, you look at them and you say, okay, well, let me tweak something in the model and continue. Okay, so the really uh, kind of value proposition, maybe the next slide is even better here, is, you know, not unfamiliar. It's the ability to have these infinite resources uh, and pay only for the resources while you're using it. So you launch a cluster, you run your simulation, you shut it down, and this is where the money saving I is coming from. And of course, there are various ways in which you can run this. Uh, uh, we talked about Spot, perhaps, so I can mention it again. Um, but, you know, and contrast this with HPC, with, again, heavy investments and, and having to manage those resources, making sure that they're actually used once you uh, uh, purchase them. But the most important thing, too, is, is that it's the ability to match the architecture of your cluster to the job. Because you have all the flexibility. If you need GPUs or some specialized uh, processors, you can pick and choose. You don't have to invest ahead of time, right? You can just grab what is there and then choose things like, is it spot market, on-demand mar market, giving you the ability to uh, save uh, uh, additional resources. So looking now at... Um, my HPC. Uh, the reason I bring it up today is because the My RFD portal that you'll see in a demo is essentially uh, a version of My HPC that Nice uh, developed for RFD, right? And so this solution is now also available to other kind of applications and other companies, uh, but it requires essentially a, a professional services contract where um, this solution needs to be. Uh, customized, it needs to be deployed, and it needs to be managed, um, or perhaps, uh, you know, you, you need to be trained to know how to manage it yourself, right? So when I'm showing you my HPC, uh, basically think about my RFD that uh, you will see in a bit. Okay. So again, this solution is using the same engine frame, the same DCV technology uh, that I talked about, and... Uh, um, again, if you reach out to somebody like uh, Bruno, they can help you um, uh, understand how this could be deployed uh, uh, for your applications. And essentially, MyHPC as a solution comes in several uh, flavors. Uh, you can deploy it um, kind of just on AWS, just in the cloud. Uh, but oftentimes, you actually need to integrate it with your own on-premises systems because your data may be residing uh, within your kind of corporate environment that you want to start uploading. Your engineers may be sitting in there, so you need some secure connections. Or the engineers could be actually sitting at home, and that's also supported in this mode, and we'll see that in a bit. Uh, and the last uh, mode for ISV, this is precisely the Rockflow Dynamics uh, case because uh, here this portal is available for multi-tenant, ma many customers who can decide what clusters they need and what type of jobs to submit. So this is quickly just showing you a few diagrams for these three different modes of, of uh, supporting this solution, right? So this is a pure AWS um, a mode uh, with some HTTP kind of portal. Uh, you have another version where um, there is an extension and a secure connection with your on-premises, just like I said. 
And, you know, and somehow S3 is involved. You see the red bucket. That's because the data uh, gets uploaded to S3 uh, and get pre-staged there, and the results could be saved there as well. And this is more or less the Rockflow Dynamics case because now you have this notion of many application stacks that the portal can manage for different customers. And this also takes care of, uh, uh, you know, effectively looking at how much uh, money and how many resources a particular customer has spent. And, and an application stack, uh, it could consist of different things because some, some of them require GPUs, others p plain kind of CPU-based uh, computational clusters. There's typically kind of a visualization uh, interface um, that you need to uh, have, for example, on G2, uh, like the cases with RFD. And then there is a connection uh, uh, gateway to the rest of uh, the solution. So this is the form in which this solution exists today. Uh, you can build something like that yourself as well using engine frame using dcv maybe cfn cluster and, and other things out there um, but keep in mind that that option is also there great so this is a time for me to uh, bring uh, scott harrison on stage but please welcome scott uh, he is going to talk about kind of rfd's vision and uh, t navigator as well thank you scott thank you very much Thank you, Dennis, and um, pleasure to be here, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having us. Uh, I'm going to start the presentation, and what I want to do, actually, is just give an overview about oil and gas challenges, uh, why we do what we do, and how the partnership with AWS and with NICE is so successful. Uh, we consider it some sort of game changer within the industry. So behind me, some like nice, cool images. You know, We do use uh, petroleum for these types of things, cars, boats. I'm pretty sure most of us flew in here. Uh, my hero down there, Homer, uh, likes to keep himself cool in the hot days. I'm actually based in Scotland, so when I left on Saturday morning, it was about minus two. It's nice to be able to keep myself warm and the family warm. Um, we, we need it, though. I mean, even while we look at new ways to develop like cleaner solutions, uh, even like you know the electric cars, they, they need plastics uh, in order to create them. So there's still a huge um, importance uh, that we keep being able to produce hydrocarbons so that we can keep evolving the way we do. So, as an analogy, uh, oil and gas company, what they want to do is acquire uh, an area of land known as a field or an asset. Um, let me just give you an example close to home from where I am, uh, about 110 uh, miles uh, east offshore of Aberdeen. Uh, there's a field there, it's about 90 square kilometers. So up here, I've taken a web-based image. Uh, this is roughly, you know, similar size scale. Uh, and what you're trying to do is, you know, this is um, an obligation for you to try and recover the hydrocarbons successfully over a number of years. And the business, what they want to do is optimize their returns. So they have a team of individuals, highly skilled people, uh, who to do this subsurface work. It's made up of different disciplines. You'd have geophysicists, geologists, petrophysicists, petroleum engineers, reservoir engineers, all trying to work inside the same space, uh, all trying to make sure that uh, they produce the right returns for their company. So we magnify which section we're interested in. In the oil and gas companies, what they would do is probably start with some sort of seismic survey. This allows them to identify the structure, look at the rock stratigraphy. This indicates to them roughly um, the outlay of the, the asset that they're looking into. So okay, in this example, we narrow into the strip. From there, uh, the next stage in oil and gas, you want to create a geological model. So here we can do this with this. It looks pretty good. Uh, we can kind of identify where we are. And if we look at this, this is the MGM. Uh, in the oil and gas industry, we describe this as like a course model. Uh, you know, it's um, got a little bit of detail, but clearly not enough for us to be quite certain of what we're looking at there. So this actually takes us to the next level. Uh, what we're looking at here in terms of this image built with blocks, which uh, you know, we all love to build these models from a young age, and certainly today I like to build them. Uh, you can represent the MGM quite nicely there. So as a geological model, you want to be quite accurate with what you're doing. You want to represent your asset, your field, 
with a high resolution. This gives you a greater understanding of what you deal with, uh, and therefore you uh, can understand your reservoir better. Because the next step, once you do that, is you want to do some dynamic calculations. So you input different types of properties into these bricks, but using software technology. So you make a computer-based model. So this is a particular area inside your asset. But what you want to do the next step is try and make this you know, a full field representation. You want to understand the whole area and the whole system, how it all ties in together. What happens when you drill a well to the reservoir? You know you're gonna take some oil or gas out the ground. How does that affect the rest of your field? Where do you make your next move and make it economical and get your best returns? Uh, so if we look at this image here, uh, and we look at the Eiffel Tower. Last week I was in Germany at one of our clients and uh, I was looking at their internal magazine. So the Eiffel Tower structure here we see on the strip, it's about 158 meters high. Uh, their target that they were drilling the well in the North Sea uh, was about 3,000 meters. So it's about 20 times this Eiffel Tower we can see on the strip here. Uh, what they're using, the drill bit, is approximately the size of my head, give or take a few inches. And the target layer is about two to three meters, which is myself with some heels on. So the complexity to land that perfectly in order to maximize the return and get the best leverage from their field is enormous. And these wells to drill cost somewhere between, anywhere between 10 million to 200 million, something like that region. It's a hugely costly mistake if you miss. So why have I explained all this? This next image is actually uh, taken from our software. We have something called T-Navigator. Vasily is gonna do a live demo of it uh, and explain exactly how we use it on the cloud. You can see on this window, there's like hundreds of little buttons. And actually our clients who use the software, they love it. They, this is actually easy for them to use. So it kind of explains the complexity that they're dealing with day in, day out, how many different properties have to deal with it. The data is the company's most valuable asset because basically what they're doing with the data is making a forensic analysis of the reservoir. They're trying to piece everything together so they understand it. Because while my description of looking at the strip was great, we can all actually see it. However, everything we're doing is like underground, so we never truly, truly can picture it. We just do our best with models. So anyway. As a business, Rockflow Dynamics, we created a reservoir simulator. So with a simulator, what you do is dynamic forecasting of your asset, which means that you're looking at like the returns. So you've gone from creating a structure, making a static model, introducing properties. Now you're running dynamic models, which gives you a forecast. Yesterday's approach, unfortunately, the software back then, uh, they weren't considering today's hardware. So they could never really take advantage of it. There was like problems with algorithms, therefore there's a saturation and acceleration. Uh, ourselves as T-Navigators, Rockflow Dynamics, the T-Navigator product, we've tested it up to 4,096 cores. Uh, this model was about 22 million active grid blocks. We saw an acceleration of 1,328 times. So effectively it's like limit limitless scalability. You just add hardware uh, and you can take your models down. Uh, you know, in terms of a timely uh, calculation speed. Um, so this is great because actually the other thing to add to this is you can also simulate at the high resolution. Uh, these other uh, technologies, what you had to do was compromise. You had to kind of get rid of some of the data uh, in order to actually simulate it in a timely manner. Otherwise you'd be waiting weeks or months uh, and this is just, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to run your project. Uh, so this is where Two Navigator really like adds some value. You can run at high resolution, uh, and you can run it at quick speed. You know, it's got the parallel scalability. So why do you want to do this? So uh, the whole point is actually, if you run at this high resolution, uh, what studies have shown, which, uh, you know, history matching has shown is that actually, you get what we describe as a more pessimistic forecast. Now, this is a good thing, uh, because actually what you'll do is make a more informed decision uh, in terms of how to best place your money, uh, where you should put these wells, how you recover the hydrocarbons. So with T-Navigator, what we have, fully parallel subsurface software. Um, it's integrated uh, with different domains. So actually, I talked earlier about how the subsurface team have a number of different disciplines involved. So it's all inside single application now. Um, we've created a user interface which is easy to use. And it changes the dynamics. 
typical approaches for subsurface analysis. You can now, because uh, we have introduced this parallel scalability, introduced this intuitive functionality, instead of the previous standard workflows, we can change it. This is helped and aided by resources from Amazon Web Services being able to use the cloud, uh, because now it's, as Dennis said earlier, extremely scalable. I'll give you one uh, example before I finish. Is a company, they did two projects side by side. They used um, our software, our technology, and cloud solution. And what they did was run something like 60 plus thousand cases. So the, the models they created were like large variation, thousands and thousands of calculations, and actually against the current practice or the standard practice in workflows, the upside to the business was in the region of $1 billion. So it completely changes conceptually how companies can do this ana analytics on their oil and gas reservoirs. This is our interface. Uh, I've said all my piece. I thank you very much for your time. I'm going to invite Vasily now to take over and do the demonstration. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. So um, my part is to, uh, to show some, um, basically give you some entertainment. And um, so my name is Vasily Shelkov. And um, basically what I'd like to do is to, to show you the steps and how the workflow was set up. When we started this work with NICE and uh, Bruna Franzini is here, what we wanted to do is to basically uh, break away from the standard practice which exists in uh, this kind of conservative field where people would prepare something, you know, submit to the bad job, wait for the results, bring data, do the analysis and uh, do it all over again. Uh, what we wanted to do is to basically put everything on the cloud, on AWS cloud. So we'll have a, a graphical workstation, we'll have a virtual cluster dedicated to you, high uh, network performance, and then, uh, you know, a connection to S3 so you can, you'll be able to move data between transient and static. Uh, storage. Um, so the way it's set up, we have a portal. So this is an example of the portal. You can see that um, uh, we have some, the manager can actually create products uh, for customers. What, we, what you see here is different combinations of uh, graphical interfaces, how many compute nodes, what kind of storage. And then uh, we define the, you know, the, the, how much disk space and then for how much this offer uh, works. Then we go to, from products to offers and basically uh, create a name and then uh, define the price. So this is the price in, uh, uh, in you know, USD. And then we, we post it to the, the client's web page and the client decide, okay, do I want to do it or I want two weeks instead of one week and so on and so forth. So let me go to uh, my kind of account so you can see here two stacks which I created. So two separate virtual uh, personal clusters. I go to the to this one. So I click on it. So web page takes me to the actually from the management kind of page to the instance itself. I go to services. For fun, I'm using the data center located in Ireland. So just to give you an idea that I still I will be able to do 3D, you know, do for post-processing, uh, pre-processing on something which is far away. Uh, so what I want to do is to connect to, to actually create a desktop where I'm going to do full 3D kind of manipulations, pre-processing. Uh, this is the status. It's going. And um, OK, I think it's created. And then now what I'm going to do is move data from uh, S3. So we have some uh, file prepared um, in S3. So I basically go find it, click on this, say OK. Then say please unzip inside the virtual personal cluster which I uh, created, submit. It takes uh, basically an instance to, to make uh, this copy. I think it's already done. And then um, I go to desktop and open uh, uh, the, actually the desktop. This is DCV from NICE. So this is my uh, graphical 
desktop hosted in Ireland. I open the interface. Data is, is already copied from S3. And when I'm done with my simulations, I actually can store data back to S3. So this way we avoid uh, slow internet connections. I open the, the project in a geolo geological static model. Go inside. I specify the license. License is served from outside. So we actually, we actually supply the license server from uh, hosted at our own uh, infrastructure. But it can be done also from, uh, from uh, AWS. So this is my geological model. Let me show you, it's a lot of data. Uh, it's a lot of information, uh, which is, uh, you can see here. Let me make some changes. Um, so basically, uh, what you see here is a very expensive uh, piece of data. There's two types of data here. So these funny looking surfaces, so you can see I can rotate on the screen, right? The, 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 the price of data which you're looking at is something close to 100 million bucks. Because like this surface which you see on the top, it's something which is uh, produced from analyzing of seismic. Seismic, you actually put explosives in the field. You know, if it's offshore, you have to put ships. Then you put sensors to actually get the, the, the sound wave coming back. You re try to interpret the surface. You find a high contrast uh, kind of uh, areas in, under the ground, and you try to uh, kind of correlate them with the information coming from wells. Well information in these uh, cylinders going up and down. There are a lot of information in this test. What you do, you actually put the sensors inside the well, and you go and you try to do, you know, the, the, the pro, you know, neutron uh, kind of tests. You do electrical measurements. You do sound measurements, all kind of different measurements. And each of these measurements costs lots of money. The precision for the for the information from inside the well is about one centimeter. Precision for getting the surfaces from seismic studies is about one meter. So you try to put everything together to get as much as possible out of this data, and then you define the place where you put your reservoir. This is the area with the grids. So you think your hydrocarbons are there, you know the top, you know the bottom, so you create the grid. But everything is uncertain. So it's expensive data takes uh, you know, a year to get it, a few years, hundreds of people, uh, tons of money. So what you want is to minimize the uncertainty, so mitigate the risks. So there are two things, you know, there are two types of risks. As you know from high school, there are systematic error, there is a statistical error. So systematic error means that you have to get a better model, high resolution model. The statistic error is basically you need to get lots of statistics uh, and reduce the, the uncertainty. Basically, you have to have more models. So better models, more models. Uh, so let's actually now move to something we call workflow. Workflow effectively a Python script which runs and creates this model from scratch, from original data. So it takes the measurements inside the wells, takes the seismic interpretations, puts everything together, regenerates the grid, pr propagates the properties, and so on and so forth. And many of these parameters are set up in this framework as variables. So when I'm running the, 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 the Monte Carlo simulations, uh, I'm, you will actually see these parameters change. So every time I'm running simulation, the grid, the whole model will be actually slightly different. Okay, so now I'm going from static model to dynamic model. What it means that what we are looking at, this little thing, you know, the 3D uh, image behind me, is something which is like day zero. This is what you get when you open, when you discover the field, we call it green field. You have something which is a, you know, beginning of your production. But you want to do is to create some kind of time machine. You would like to see what's gonna happen if I put one well, two well in one year, two years, you know, when I have to put some, maybe inject some water, you know, stuff like this. So you have to solve differential equations. You know, every time somebody says, I, I can see the future, it means he can integrate differential equations very well. And so the bigger the grid, the more bigger the system of differential equations. So for example, if you have a grid with billion, it's effectively billion 
uh, billion differential equations, system of billion differential equations we have to solve. So you need lots of cycles. This is where AWS HPC comes in the place because we need lots of, we basically need the cluster to, to do this forward uh, propagation. Okay, so I created the dynamic model and now I would like actually to run uncertainty analysis where I would, I would change the model and also I will change uh, dynamic parameters like for example the, uh, the property of my fluids and so on and so forth so everything together will be a, will be like a part of uh, variation in Monte Carlo so instead of local host I take uh, my HPC so it's actually a local cluster with MPI all the libraries already installed and then I say I'd like to use four nodes for each run, I, I have a choice to use GPU. I don't use it uh, for this uh, test. And then I say that I want to run uh, basically a Latin Hypercube, which is Monte Carlo. I want to have one job per run. And I have 100 realizations all together. So it's how many cases I want to actually put in my uh, statistical uh, uh, statistic sample. And I press OK. That's it. So what... Um, what we see now is the screen is basically a batch manager. It's a batch manager of my uh, virtual cluster. Um, so you see two, two types of things going on on the screen. So you say running workflow. It means that all the input data, seismic well information is analyzed, new model is built, some parameters are varied within the error kind of uh, bars, right? Then the model is created and then thrown on four nodes of the cluster. We can put 40 nodes just for this demonstration, use four. So the results are calculated and then we immediately, after the, the, res, the, 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 the case is done, the case is calculated, we can look at, for example, uh, analytics. So we're actually doing post-processing at runtime uh, in, real, in, real, uh, in real time. So we're looking, for example, this is a gas field. We're looking at gas production the dots errors for specific dates. The X axis is a date. The Y axis is the how much gas we can produce from this field given all the input information. Uh, we can change, again, this is uh, actually hosted in uh, Ireland. We can change uh, graphics. We can go and, for example, look at how much sensitivity, for example, my gas production has as a function of these variables. Which, uh, which I put in. So one of the variables is position of the top uh, seismic surface, in up and down, right? Then some correlations and so on. So we immediately do statistical analysis uh, for static and dynamic variables. And uh, you can see calculations going on and so forth. So you can have, a, in this case, this is one virtual per per personal cluster. You put static, you, you put a dynamic, uh, parameters all together, you do immediate post-processing, and if you like the results, you can bring some of them, some metadata back to your desktop. If, if you don't want this, you can actually put it back to S3. But what's, what's great about this, this is full replacement of the workbench of the engineer. You actually don't really use your computer. I can, I can do it from my iPad. You know, I really don't need a, a thick client anymore. And uh, so what we can, uh, we can look at... Uh, uh, so let me show you okay, one, uh, okay, one case here I wanted to show you. So it's more or less what I wanted to, to demonstrate. Um, the, main, uh, the main thing about this that we actually work, you know, put this together with real clients. So we go around uh, the, you know, Europe, US, and we show the, the companies that, you know, AWS is a platform where you can do everything, not just batch processing, not just some kind of analytical uh, work. You can actually do pre-processing, you can do supercomputing, right? And you can do post-processing, all in one kind of realization. It's all controlled by <coughs> web page. It can be changed, you know, you can run two realization, 10, whatever you want. So it's pretty much the um, end of my presentation. So if you have any questions, please go ahead. And um, 
you know, I'll be I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Uh, if again we have microphones, or just come forward. This is a fairly cozy uh, environment, so don't uh, uh, don't be shy. <laughs>